Over the course of this last year, I have been involved in two different series of lessons. Watch this, from time to time. I haven't been able to put them all together from week to week. And uh, one of them involves our theme for the year, which is I Am Resolved. And the other was entitled as follows, Responsibilities toward truth. My friends, God has revealed His truth to mankind. And God has placed upon us as the ones who are the most important recipients of that truth certain responsibilities. We are to hear the truth. We are to believe the truth. We are to love the truth. We are to obey the truth. And we are to defend the truth of God's Word as His people and ha in possession of that word. Today we're going to continue that thought, and this will be the last in this particular series of lessons. And I don't believe that I've ever heard a lesson entitled this way, and I know that I have never preached this particular lesson in all the years that I'm preaching. But we have a responsibility toward the truth, and the responsibility simply is this, to enjoy the truth. Folks, God never intended for His truth to be a burden upon us. He never intended it to be something that causes us to be down and depressed and burdened and heavy laden. He always intended for it to be something that brings us joy and pleasure. And so I want to talk about that for the next few moments. The first point that we're going to look at involves two Old Testament words. Now, if you read these words in the English language, they are identical. But if you were to read them in the Hebrew language, they are two different words. The first place wherein a word is found is in Psalm 1 verse 2. The psalmist is talking about the blessed man, the righteous man, the godly man. And in verse 2, notice what he says about him. But his delight in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Notice that passage says that the blessed man, that righteous man, delights in the law of the Almighty God. That little word delight means this, to take pleasure in, to take delight in, to be delighted. There was something about the Word of God that caused the psalmist to have an unbelievable pleasure therein. We turn to Psalm 119, verse 16, and again we read this word delight, but it is a different word in the Hebrew language. Notice what the psalmist said, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. The word there means pleasure. It means delight. Notice also that it means to be amused. Folks, the psalmist said there is something about the Word of God that brings me unbelievable joy and pleasure and amusement and delight found therein. Every one of us needs to come to that same understanding that the psalmist had. Every one of us ought to be able to say, the Word of God delights my soul. There's many passages that talk about it. Another one is Psalm 119, verse 47. For there the psalmist says, I will delight myself in thy word. Folks, the word of God over and over the psalmist says brings delight. The question that I want to ask is this. Why does truth bring enjoyment? Why does truth bring delight to the hearts of men and women. Sometimes in lessons, there are things that a preacher says that he wants to get across to his audience. And in just an unmistakable manner, folks, he wants them to come to an understanding of it just as much as he understands it. And sometimes we're not always able to communicate that effectively. If there is a point in this lesson that I want you as a congregation to get, it's this point, and it's rather lengthy, but I want you to come to an understanding of why you and I can enjoy truth. One reason we can enjoy the truth is because there is absolutely no harm to one's health 
when they obey the Word of God. Guys, you can take any commandment of God, implement that command in your life, and guess what? There is not going to be any harm brought to your life because you submitted to the command. Now, granted, there are going to be individuals out there who don't like what you do, and they may bring harm to you, but folks, there is absolutely nothing that God commands us, wants us to do, that is in any way going to harm our health. That in and of itself ought to be enough to cause us to enjoy the truth, isn't it? Can that be said of sin? Can that be said of iniquity? Can you and I engage in sinful acts and sinful activity and not be harmed thereby, folks? That just cannot be said. I've given a passage there, Proverbs chapter 23, beginning at verse 29, and there are six questions that are asked in that first verse. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contention? Who hath babblings? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? Wow, that is an unbelievable description, is it not? He's talking about a very specific individual. And he answers exactly who it is in the very next verse. They that tarry long at the wine. They that seek after mixed wine. You ever seen an old boy who's hooked on alcohol? The ones that I've seen, they look pretty rough, you know that? The minute you see them, you can almost identify them, can't you? They look rough, they talk rough, you look into their eyes and you know that everything isn't there. They're not sober-minded. Folks, their health is failing. Many of them ultimately get put on dialysis and many of them die. Why? Because of sin and iniquity. Such cannot be said of the Word of God. Why do I delight in the Word of God? Because it will never, ever harm my health. Number two, why do I delight in the Word of God? Because it will not stain my soul with sin. Now we've moved beyond this outward man, haven't we? Folks, now we're talking about the inward man. There's not one thing you do in compliance with the will of God that will ever cause your soul to be stained with any kind of sin and iniquity. Why? Because sin is the transgression of the law. Obedience has nothing to do with that. Psalm 119 verse 9 says this, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? He then says this, By taking heed according to thy word. Young people, listen to me. If you want your lives to be pure, if you want your lives to be holy, if you want your lives to be godly, if you want to get away from sin and iniquity and the stain that comes to the soul, here's all you have to do. Abide by the precious Word of God. Folks, isn't it a wonderful thought to think that I can live my life in such a way that there is no sin on my soul? How do I do that? Just abide by the Word of God. Thirdly, the Word of God doesn't trifle with my time. Folks, isn't time a valuable commodity? The very moment that one second is spent, you can never get it back, can you? It's gone forever. Let me ask you this. How many of us engage in trifling activities? Anybody do that? You know, I like a little bit of law and order. I don't mean that from a social perspective. I'm talking about the television show. I just like that show. Kathleen knows it. She walks in and goes, oh, again? I like Family Feud. Steve Harvey, he's a nut, man. He makes that show, doesn't he? I like a little Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. 
Guys, I can come in in the evening, sit down in my lazy boy, turn on the television, and I can very easily spend two hours watching those three or four shows, and when I get up, guess what? I am not one ounce better than I was when I sat down. You know that? I've just trifled away my time. Now, such is not the case with the Word of God. Guys, if you and I take the Word of God and we make application of the Word of God in our lives, you will never, ever, ever be wasting your time. You will be adding to your character, 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 8. There will be additions to the precious body of Jesus Christ, Romans 1, verse 13. My friends, there will be service that is done to others. Galatians 5, verse 13. And we will be involving ourselves in the precious work of the church. Titus 2, verse 14. None of those things that we just spoke of there are a waste of our time. Sometimes we need to turn off the television. Sometimes we need to shut the books. Sometimes we need to turn off the radio. Sometimes we need to get up off the couch. And we need to do what God wants us to do because when we do, we never ever trifle with time. Number four, the Word of God and obedience thereunto will never cause me to deviate from my destination. Question. Is there a place where you desperately want to go? There's a place that I want to go. I don't know about you, and it's called heaven. I want to go there, don't you? Well, guys, there's only one way to get there. And guess how that is? That's by abiding by the Word of the living God. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is God's Word which directs me as to how to get to that place where I want to go. Can you imagine throwing aside the Word of God, just living your life here, and then waking up at a destination on the last day? Folks, I don't want that destination. Do you? Not me. You see, the Bible's been given so that I know I will never deviate from the place where I want to go. Notice this next point. No regret of rebellion. Regret. That feeling that we get that we know we shouldn't have done something, isn't it? I've done wrong. I've erred. We know what we should have done, and yet we can't say that we've done it. We know what we shouldn't have done, and oftentimes we have to admit that we have done that. That's regret. As long as I focus my attention upon the Word of God and obey it, guess what? There is never going to be any regret of rebellion in my life. There are three men who are closely tied together by one phrase. Achan, David, and Judas. All three of those men had to say exactly the same words. I have sinned. Folks, those are words of regret. I've done wrong. I've erred. I've violated the commands of God. I am not where I need to be in my relationship with God. Words of regret. How wonderful it would be to be able to say these words, the ones that are listed, I have not sinned. Folks, there's pleasure in that, isn't there? Notice this next one. There's no conflict of conscience. God has placed within every human being a conscience. I define the conscience as follows. A feeling that originates in the mind that either condemns or approves my actions based upon how my mind has been trained. When we know what we are supposed to do and we don't do it, there is supposed to be a feeling of shame and guilt that overwhelms the human being. And oftentimes, isn't that the case, especially with us? We know what God wants. We know what God expects of us. We've heard 
His message proclaimed. We know what we're supposed to do, and yet we violate the Word of God, and guilt and shame overcome us, don't they? David committed sin with Bathsheba, didn't he? Even slew her husband in order to cover up that sin. Took that woman as his own wife in order to cover up his sins. And it was a long period of time before that sin was exposed. When you turn to Psalm 32, David tells us a little bit about how he felt during that time when he was covering his sin. Do you know that? He says this, When I was silenced, my bones waxed old through the roaring that is in me. What's he talking about? Folks, his mind was constantly being stirred because of what he had done. There was this constant roaring deep within. I've committed adultery. I've committed murder. I've sinned against my God. I have violated the will of God. And yet every day, what did he do? He just continued to cover it up and cover it up and cover it up. And he says, my bones were waxing old because of that. But you see, when I live in harmony with the will of God... There is no roaring within, is there? There's only a deep whisper that says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You and I are able to go to bed at night and we're able to sleep peaceably knowing that we are in a right relationship with the Almighty God, can't we? No sting of conscience and obedience. Watch this one. No fear of the Father. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that God loves every man, doesn't He? And it doesn't matter whether that individual is His child or whether that individual is an alien sinner. He loves all men, but God will hold all men accountable. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 14. Folks, God is going to judge us. God is going to have us stand before Him and we are going to give an account of our deeds before Him. Now if you honestly step back and if you honestly think about that, that ought to cause you to shake and quiver and tremble. I've got to be accountable to God and if I have violated His will, it ought to scare me to death. Did you know that? If I'm not striving to do the best I can possibly do in harmony with what He has written in His Word, it ought to scare me to death to stand before Him. But if I'm obedient and I know that I'm well-pleasing unto the Father, guys, I know that I'm protected. And I know that in the sight of my Heavenly Father, He is well-pleased in what I have done. Notice this next one. There is absolutely no scare for my soul. The writer of Hebrews said, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Hebrews 10, verses 26 and 27. Folks, there is coming a day of judgment. There is coming a day of God's wrath. There is coming that day when God is going to punish those who have not obeyed the precious gospel. But guess what? If we're living in harmony with truth, I have absolutely nothing to fear, do I? Nothing. Folks, I can be fully persuaded that I'm going to escape the wrath of God and I'm going to receive nothing more than His pleasure and all of His rewards in the last day. That leads to the last point. There's no horror of the hereafter. The writer of Revelation says, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. 
Folks, if I'm doing what God wants me to do, I know that one of these days, heaven is mine. I know that I'm going to walk through those gates. I'm going to walk on that street of gold. That I'm going to live in fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit forever and ever with all the redeemed through all the ages. And there's absolutely nothing that I have to worry about. I want you to just think about those things. If those kind of things don't bring you pleasure in truth, then something's wrong, isn't it? Something's wrong. Point number three. Let's very briefly and very quickly make a contrast between delighting in the Word of God and having displeasure in the Word of God. You see, both of these positions have manifestations to other individuals. And we can see it. We can tell whether an individual really delights in God's Word or whether he really has trouble and struggles with doing what God wants him to do. Because you see, number one, if I delight in God's Word, there's joy, is there not? There's happiness. But if I don't, there's this sense of dread about what God wants me to do. Every first day of the week, the Bible says we are to assemble with the saints and that we are to worship the Almighty God. Did you know there are individuals who wake up on Sunday morning and they literally dread that? Oh, it's Sunday. Can you imagine? But there's others who arise like the psalmist and who say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. You see, they, they arise with joy. I want to do what God wants me to do. I love doing what God wants me to do. It brings me pleasure and happiness. It's not a sense of dread. Oh, i got to do this. What about this one? Individuals who delight in the Word of God have a gratitude for the Word of God and not a constant complaining. You ever heard anybody complain because they have to do what God wants them to do? It's pitiful, isn't it? I got to dress a certain way. I can't go here. I can't go there. I can't do this. I can't do that. Just gripe and complain. And then there's other individuals who are grateful that God has revealed His will to us so that we can stand acceptable in His sight. And they know that that will is good for them. That God would never do anything. That would cause them to suffer pain and anguish. And therefore they're glad that God has given these commands. They're glad that they have this wall about them that protects them and teaches them how they are to live in this life. Then there's others who display a willingness to do what God says, but some do it out of a sheer sense of duty and obligation. Could have gone to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 and talked about giving. At that point, can I? Folks, giving is something that God authorizes, not the preacher. Okay? That's God's doing. You don't like that, just die, go to heaven, and talk to God about giving. Right? But you see, when we give, God wants us to approach our giving in a certain way, doesn't He? He doesn't want us to do it out of a sense of duty and a sense of obligation. Folks, He wants us to do it because we desire to do it, because we have a will to do it. God has given all for us, has He not? He's given His precious Son for me upon the cross of Calvary. Surely I want to give back because of what He's done on my behalf. Or there's that sense of duty. Well, I'll cut a check, throw in a couple of dollars, whatever. You see, it's a totally different mindset we're talking about. Notice this next one. There are some individuals who when they hear what God wants us to do, they're going to do it with excellence. This is what God desires. This is what God has authorized. This is what God has approved. And I'm going to do it with every fiber of my being. And I'm going to do all I can do. 100%. And then there are some who just barely do it, don't they? Notice meager performance. Just enough to say what? Well, I got her done. 
See, that's not enjoying the Word of God. How about this one? There's some who are deeply concerned about God's Word and whether God's Word is being carried out or not carried out. Folks, it's on their mind constantly. In fact, they're constantly asking themselves, am I doing what God wants to do or am I not doing what God wants to do? And then there's other individuals who say, well, I really don't care about that, not right now. How about this one? There's some who are truly invested. When I mean invested, I mean this. They give their heart, soul, mind, and strength to do what God wants them to do. And then there's others who are just kind of going through the motions. Let me just go through the motions and, and maybe God will be pleased with me. Their heart's not in it. Their soul's not in it. Their spirit isn't there. Folks, here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask yourself the question, which one of those two sides describes you? I'm not here to judge you. But I want you to step back and I want you to take a personal inventory. Because you see, God wants me to enjoy His Word. God wants me to delight in His Word. He wants me to be on this left-hand side. He doesn't want me on that right-hand side with displeasure toward the Word of God. Another point. Why people do not enjoy the truth. I bet you we could find a hundred different reasons why, don't you? It's going to be a long point right here. I don't have that many. Here's the first one. What about this one? Selfishness. Selfishness. Guys, so oftentimes we want to do what we want to do, don't we? I want to do it my way. And I don't want anybody telling me how it's supposed to be done. And then all of a sudden, here comes truth. And truth conflicts with the way I want to do things. And so, therefore, I'm put in a dilemma, aren't I? I either put away my selfish will and yield to God's will, or I accept my will and I have to be displeased with what God desires of me. And we see that in the rich man, don't we? That rich man came to Jesus. What must I do to have eternal life? Jesus tells him, what lack I yet? Go and sell all that you have. Folks, in verse 22, the Bible says this, and when he heard that saying, guess what? He was filled with sorrow. Went away from Jesus. Why? Because he had great riches. You see, the Word of God brought him what? displeasure, didn't it? I want my things. I want my riches. I want my treasure. And God wants me to give it all up. I can't do that. And he went away sorrowful at that saying. Displeasure toward the Word of God. What about this one? Unbelief. We like to think that we're pretty smart, don't we? We have minds. We've been educated in good schools. We've paid big bucks for those educations. Oh, we're just smart as a whip. And then all of a sudden, here comes God. And He starts speaking. And oftentimes the things that He has to say to us contradicts the things that you and I believe. So again, I'm at a dilemma. Am I going to believe God or am I going to believe what I believe? And many times... Individuals refuse what God says. In fact, they get angry at what God says. And it's all because of disbelief, is it not? Hebrews 4 verse 2. We're in Hebrews 3 right now on Wednesday night talking about those Israelites who are wandering in the wilderness. This is a passage that still talks about those individuals. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. He then says this, But the word did not profit them. Talking about the Israelites. Why? being not mixed with faith in them that heard it. God said, go take the promised land. I'll be with you. You can overcome all of those giants that are in the land. The land will be yours. And what did the Jews say? Oh, no, we can't. Total unbelief. You see, they didn't rejoice in God's Word. In fact, they disbelieved God's Word. And there was travail to pay because of it, wasn't there? How about this one? A love for other things. Satan and this world have a lot of things in it, don't they? 
And folks, these things aren't sinful per se, are they? I like a good ball game as much as anybody does. I love to watch a little football game every now and then. Because there are people who love that stuff. You know it? I mean, their time, their minds, their lives revolve completely around the game of football. They are totally immersed in it. Even to the point where they will neglect God and spiritual things because of that. Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You see, sometimes it's easy to love other things rather than loving the things that we're supposed to love, spiritual things, and especially the truth of God's Word. How about this one? There are individuals who have it in their mind that truth is dull and bland and plain and boring and irrelevant. Folks, why do you think all of these churches exist that have thousands of people use entertainment, huge screens, all kinds of lighting, all kinds of dramatics in order to draw the masses. Because they believe deep in their minds, if all we did was preach the Word, guess what? That's dull and dry and boring, and people won't come. It's amazing, isn't it? That's what we're competing with today. Two points that I would make is this. Number one, the Word of God is not dull and dry and boring. The Bible says, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active. It just depends upon how we view it. The problem is, the individual's heart is dull and dry and covered over so that it has no feelings. Secondly, today people love fluff. And they love entertainment rather than loving words that are truth and soberness. Acts 26, verse 25. Folks, God didn't reveal His will to entertain us. He revealed His will to save us. That's why He did it. He doesn't appeal to the emotional component of man first. He appeals to the reasoning component of man first. Then feelings follow. But you see, individuals want to feel good rather than reason. Individuals want to go away excited and pumped up rather than having to sit down and seriously consider the state of their soul before the Almighty God. And when you just preach the truth, guess what? They just think it's dull and dry and boring. Here's another reason men don't love the truth and aren't excited by the truth because you see, truth does what? Truth disposes of pride and truth despises or disposes one of his position. I mean, we have evolved, haven't we? And we are the height of evolution. It's the survival of the fittest. And guess what? Look where we are as human beings. But then all of a sudden, God comes along. You're not evolved. You're created. And you're created by me. And this is my truth. This is my will. And you have to submit to that to be right in my sight. Folks, men hate that. Men despise that. Who's going to tell me what to do? You see, I've got to get down off my high and mighty horse and I've got to say, God, You are the true and living God. I am subject to You and I will obey You in all things. That is not what many want to do in our society. And thus, because of that, they don't find pleasure in truth. Wow. Folks, if you're a Christian... You are a disciple. If you are a disciple, you are a learner. And if you are a learner, the thing that you are supposed to learn are the words of Jesus.
Isn't that true? And here's the reality. Jesus' words ought to excite us. They ought to empower us. They ought to inspire us, regardless of what the message is. Folks, if it comes from this book, we ought to be excited and energized by what's found therein. Now, I really want you to ask yourself, do you really believe this next statement? To be able to sit and hear, and then to obey and carry out the Word of God? Folks, that ought to bring you more joy than any earthly pleasure that is upon the earth. Do you know that? Oh, I could see having a child over here and saying, now, do you want to sit down and study the Bible with me? Or do you want to go on a roller coaster? Now, I know what the kid would do. You know? But folks, for those of us who are Christians, those of us who are mature in the faith, there's nothing on this earth more enjoyable and exciting than hearing the precious Word of the living God. And here's the point. If that isn't the truth, and you don't enjoy it, folks, you need to stop, and you need to look deep, deep, deep within your heart and do some self-examination. God wants His truth to be enjoyed by His people. Listen to the psalmist again. I delight to do Thy will. Oh my God, yea, Thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40 verse 8. My prayer is that we'll come to a day when all Christians can make that statement before God Almighty. Can you make that statement honestly? You delight in the law of God. It's deep within you. You have to find pleasure and enjoyment and delight and amusement in God's Word or does it pain you and trouble you? I fear maybe you need to repent and ask God to forgive you. You see, the moment that a person delights in the will of God, guess what? He's ready to obey, isn't he? Can you imagine being that old Ethiopian eunuch? studying the prophet Isaiah, not understanding what you're reading, and all of a sudden a man comes along and he teaches you about Jesus from Isaiah 53. Question, was that man excited? Let me tell you, see, here's water. What does it hinder me to be baptized? He was ready. And that very day, he submitted himself to the command of Jesus, didn't he? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Do you need to do that this morning? Follow the example of that eunuch. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. We can do that this morning for you if you desire to become a Christian. Do you need to respond? Won't you come as we stand and sing?